occurred to me. Um, all right, so Mia's trying to get on. Okay. Um, let's see. All right, so screen share. Let's go here. Does anybody, okay, Mia, um, after class, if you want me to go over all the classwork and I'll show you what's coming through and what's not coming through, right? I found one more, but I didn't find number nine or 10. So let's just do the stream right now. Um, all right, Buddhism, here's the, so my main, my first thing, is the childhood of Buddha and Jesus, right? So there was the, um, the stories of Buddha's birth and his mother uh, had to go register. <laughs> this was so interesting. I don't know how many of you know Jesus' story, but I'm reading this story of Buddha and going, wow, that's just like Jesus. Like, what is this? Um, so Buddha, Buddha's parents, the wise men told them that he was going to be special. Well, same thing happened to uh, Mary, right? Angel Gabriel comes and says, you're pregnant with God. You're going to have this special kid. And so Buddha, Buddha's parents were told this child would be special and they would either become a ruler uh, of power, political ruler, or a spiritual ruler, right? So naturally, his parents wanted him to be a political leader. So they surrounded him with all sorts of pleasures and wanted him to get habituated. So he would expect, you know, to be powerful and wealthy and all that stuff. Um, and then he had a conversion experience or a revelation in his late 20s, just like Jesus did, okay? Jesus got baptized. Um, well, the birth of Buddha, right? So his mother had to go register in her town. Jesus's father, Joseph, had to go register in Bethlehem. And so while they were traveling, <laughs> it came time for her to be delivered, right? And so Buddha's mother delivered uh, her baby under a tree, a bow tree. And then Jesus's mother delivered her child in a manger. Um, and then uh, when they were younger, Jesus had, they were traveling on the Passover. Um, they were pilgrimage, doing a pilgrimage, standard stuff. And he uh, lost on his way back, and his and he was in the temple talking to the rabbis, and they were amazed at how wise he was. Um, so it said Jesus grew up with his dad in favor, uh, uh, in in favorable to God and man. Right, he was a good little boy, and then they found him in the temple. And they were mad at him, right? How come you left us? And Jesus said, didn't you know I would be in my father's house? So there's kind of an indication that this is a serious young man. Um, and those things happen. Uh, Muhammad was a serious young man. They just rejected all this other stuff. And so um, Buddha, let me see, I, I really, let me see. Usually I'm trying to think if I have, I guess I do have my notes. Usually I have all my notes right here and I'm trying, yeah, okay. He left, okay. So the same. And so when they're, um, they were both serious, they had a sense of purpose. They were identified as a child as someone who would grow up to be some kind of leaders. There were legends that grew up around them. Um, Jesus, Buddha, the parents kind of wanted them to stick with this world, you know? They didn't really want him to be that odd. They just wanted a nice little boy. 
And then um, at, at a younger age, at a certain age, Jesus had his experience in the temple. And then Buddha, um, he was allowed outside of the palace once in a while. And he had the four passing sights. So he saw people were sick. He was protected from all this in the palace. He saw death, he saw aging, and then he saw a monk. And he thought, that's it, that's what I want. So at age in their late twenties. So psychologists say that this is about the age when your nervous system sort of forms. So that's why there's, it's a good idea after college to try out a whole lot of different jobs, to travel, to just, your mind is still growing. But if you have an education, you can go travel and you can, you know, ask good questions, recognize patterns, study history and culture. I mean, you, you can really take it in and learn from it. I mean, when I travel, it's like the world is my uh, lab, right? And every culture is like a culture in a Petri dish. I mean, every time I go to a different society, I study it as a culture, right? As an organism. And it has a history. It has a belief system. It has a way of life that is has been adaptive, right? And adapted to this particular place and time. So that's that's what I do when I travel. But in a lot of ways, if you're liberally educated, that's what every undergrad should do. It's not a big deal. It's just that that's just it's so crazy that our culture just doesn't reinforce that. It doesn't expect that. It doesn't honor that, right? It's better to become as successful as possible as soon as possible. That's crazy. Because then people have midlife crises, you know, because they say, I never did what I want to do. I just kept doing what people told me to do. I was just supposed to be successful. And now here I am 40 and I've never really decided what I really want, right? Is a good Hindu question. So each of them dabbled about, you know, and then in their late 20s, they had the great going forth. So I do want to tell you that with my own children, I, I encourage them to travel a lot in the summers during high school, in the summers during college, and then after college. And so at about age 26 or 27, they had done a whole lot of stuff. And then they said, okay, mom, I know what I want to do. And then they went to grad school. And so they are all doing what they want, right? They're not having midlife crises in the sense that I never got to do what I wanted. Um, so anyway, this happened to Jesus and Buddha. Um, he left home in search of enlightenment. He saw that, that monk and he thought, that's for me. It is pretty amazing how many people do have this kind of revelatory experience because we don't talk about it. It's just in my classes, I will have students come up and say, you know, Dr. Beck, I really do believe in reincarnation. <laughs> You're not supposed to talk about it. Um, or, you know, so, so people do have those kinds of experiences. I. Um, my colleagues, there were some other faculty at Lyon, and there used to be this uh, program called the last class, the last lecture. And so you're supposed to imagine you have one lecture left to give, and then you're supposed to give that lecture, right? And there were just a number of my colleagues who actually talked about that moment or that year when a lot of things came together and they just decided what they wanted to do with their life. And that was often in their late twenties. So uh, I'm just encouraging you to consider thinking of the life cycle that way. Um, so what he, I mean, he was very serious, right? 
he really wants to be a good Hindu. He was raised Hindu. You have to remember this. Jesus was raised Jewish. Neither one of them. Buddha was not a Buddhist and Jesus was not a Christian. Um, Buddha, you know, went a little further along in the religion. Jesus died. There was no such thing as Christianity. So you have to be kind of careful when you call yourself a Christian if it has anything to do with Jesus. Um, so anyway, he learned the wisdom of the tradition. And then what did he say? He said, you know, you can read all the books you want. You can know all the doctrines you want, but that's not what it's about. And then he tried extreme self-denial. And then he ended up like Aristotle, the middle way. Isn't that amazing? The middle way comes up, Aristotle, Confucius, and Buddha, just straight up. And then the Hindu is just this mix of a lot of things. And then he tried rigorous thought. He tried yoga. And then he sat under the tree. And he just decided, I'm going to sit here till I get liberation, right? Enlightenment, release. And psychologically, again, I think this, I think this is true psychologically. If you deny yourself pleasure, you're going to start fantasizing, like your body is going to start reacting and you're going to start thinking about food, obviously. So he, Maya is tempting him, right? He's getting these fantasies in his head. And one of them is uh, sex, right? All these sexual fantasies because he's decided he's going to deny himself. Um, and then death, right? He's that would be that would be a thought if you're deep down into your psyche and then uh challenge the right to do this what right do you have to do this you're trying to make yourself immortal and you're not um and then he had the cause the great awakening and then she said why not end it now he said there will be some that understand so the best life is one that's achieved enlightenment but comes back in the world and if you remember in the Bhagavad Gita, and you remember Gandhi imitated this, was that it was a life of action, but it was detached, right? You don't get invested in it. You don't get your emotions invested, but you act in order to create good karma. That's, that's your motive for action. Um, and he, he founded an order of monks. So there really was a kind of Buddhist um, way of life. It wasn't a religion. It was just a way of life. And he challenged the corruption of the religious establishments. So Jesus also, the devil tempted him. I don't know if you guys know these stories, but how many of you know the story of Jesus' temptation? Anybody? You can put the raise hand function if you want. Um, all right, I guess I'm the only preacher's kid around here. Uh, I don't know if I've ever had a class. I mean, it's a small class. Usually somebody's heard of it. But so the temptation is that if you, if you perform a miracle and turn the stones to bread, people will follow you, right? And um, Jesus said, people do not live by bread alone, right? He's going to be a spiritual leader not um he's not going to bribe people into believing um then throw yourself down right and god will save you and he says don't tempt god all right um and i know that my lion students have said that they have friends that will take these risks and they'll say, well, if God wants me to live, I'll live. And if God wants me to die, I'll die. It's just, <laughs> that's tempting God. That's not using your free will. That's using God to justify doing something stupid. <laughs> okay. And then if you worship me, I'll give you all this power. And he, you know, he's rejecting this world kind of power, just like Buddha did. And then he taught this message that what matters is spiritual, not physical. 
Um, and that was just the main issue in Judaism. He didn't intend to start another religion. Um, they were had a they had a cool head and a warm heart. So the united reason and faith, right? They were smart, intellectual. They weren't uh, stupid. It's not blind. Nothing about it is blind. It's very thoughtful. And then they're also warm hearted. Um, so what it is, they're, they're not unlike a cult leader. So uh, they have these same characteristics of what we would call a cult leader. So that's interesting. Like there's a borderline between the great icons of morality and the evil <laughs> geniuses, right? Who lead people astray. So um, they have a structure they have a special way of living and rituals. The leader is charismatic. Um, all right, so one example of that. Can you guys give an example of a cult leader that was also charismatic and brought had a bunch of disciples? Anyone? Uh, Kool-Aid guy in South America? Yeah, Jim Jones. Yeah. Okay. Did it have the that was a long time ago, Guiana. So I didn't know if students still heard about that. Um, that was way back in the 60s, I think, or the seven, early 70s. Um, yeah, he was very much, and um there was a Methodist preacher whose daughter was actually in that. And he was describing like she was a good person and she had really good intentions. She wanted to live in a community where people cared about each other, right? But this guy got power hungry and he started having, you know, a different woman every night come to his compound and all this stuff. So people were just naive about that. It was abused. Um, then there's the guy in, um, Waco, Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> David Koresh, right? In the 60s, there were quite a few of these people. Um, all right. So, and then I can, you know, just open question. Do you think it's important to look at the connections or the differences? Um, and I'll get to the slides later. If, if we have time, I'll get to the slides. Um, but I, I really should. Again, I talk too much. Um, let's go back to the seven aspects, six aspects of religion. So this is really important to me that you get this because there are such analogies, right? There's an analogy between Socrates, Jesus, Buddha, and we're gonna to get to Muhammad, and that's really important because I think it's so important that we first see the similarities because when I was in Indonesia, the Indonesians that I work with are humanist, Indo, you know, humanist Muslims. And they think about the stories they think about, they think about Muhammad's growing up, they think about his revelation, they think about all this stuff that's very similar. And then, of course, ignorance and politicians and all this stuff really mess it up, right? Political leaders and religious leaders have a lot of power to destroy the spirit of the religion. And a huge issue today, this is huge in your lifetime. Like, um, a major motivator in internal polarization in countries and wars and animosity between countries and the failure to stop using fossil fuels. Those three critical issues are all being fueled by a corruption of the religions. And so then science versus religion, you know, it just polarizes the secular humanists and the religious humanists. So I want you to know that's a corruption 
of the religions. It's not the spirit of the religions. It's the same kind of corruption that Jesus and Buddha and those guys were criticizing. Now Jesus and Christianity is getting used to do exactly what Jesus rejected. And same with Buddha and the same with Muhammad. So, so that's why it's important. Um, so the Hindu Brahmins, all right? The thing I like about Houston Smith is that he's so fair to each religion. So when I teach each religion, you, treat, you teach the original spirit of it. You teach it at its best. So at its best, the caste system is about some people are naturally better at running big organizations. I would be terrible at it, right? It doesn't have to do with virtue or vice. It doesn't have to do with intelligence or anything. Some people from before they're born, my oldest daughter could run the world before she was born. She's just that kind of person. And she does. And she's in Washington, D.C. doing it, you know. And then other people are just thinkers. And there's nothing you can do to stop them. And there's other people are just action. They don't want to have to think. And they don't want to have to lead. They just want to do something with their bodies all day and go to bed tired. And then some people, so the caste system is just a system where within people like you are not competing against each other. And also everybody understands that everybody contributes, right? Well, that got corrupted into the people who were natural administrators took the power and the money and they start oppressing everybody else. And if they have children who are just not the same, which happens, parents have children that do not have the same spiritual orientation. That's just the way it is. It's, and by spiritual, I mean what it is that really makes them excited, that they get passionate about, that they care about. It's, that's not genetic. It might be genetic, but it doesn't have to be. Um, all right, so the Brahmins had entrenched the caste system. So if you're a Brahmin and you have a child who's really a natural laborer, you're not gonna let that kid go down the caste to a lower caste. So that kid is up there and has all this privilege that it's not what they deserve and it not, doesn't really necessarily make them happy. But whenever you have an entrenched wealthy class and an entrenched underclass, you've got trouble. But that's what the Brahmins did. They, everything became entrenched. And so Buddha completely rejected it, right? And then everybody is seeking their own salvation. So when the Brahmins told women, the reason you were born a woman is because of some sin you committed before, or you're just a younger soul. If you keep working on it, you'll become a man. Lucky you. Um, Buddha just said no. Can you think of how radical that is? That is so radical. You have to you know, he thought women could achieve liberation. Oh, my God. I mean, that was huge. And then also untouchables. It was completely indifferent to caste. That was extremely threatening to the Brahmins because it took away all their authority. Ha, ah, they're not going to be happy about that, right? Then you had all the rituals where you have to get baptized or you have to go through this or that. And the Brahmins controlled it and they discriminated. Now, if you remember with Jesus, um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had all the control of the rituals. And one rule in religion was not to work on the Sabbath. And there were some poor women who after the harvest, 
they would try to find wheat that hadn't been picked in the harvest had just fallen off um, the stalk and was in the ground. And so they were trying to collect some wheat so they could eat and they were doing it on the Sabbath. And, and the religious leaders condemned them. And Jesus said like, the Sabbath was made for man, day of rest, not man for the Sabbath. Like you can't have such a rigid legalism that it's inhumane, right? We don't live for the rules. The rules exist so we can live. And so the Brahmins did the same thing. They had all these rituals that discriminated against people. Um, and so Buddha says, no rituals. Anybody can learn these meditation practices. Then the Brahmins had the Sanskrit was a language that the poor did not know. And so you could only be sacred if you could read the sacred books in Sanskrit. It gave you this holiness that nobody else had. And Buddha said, no, you know, none of that stuff in the Hindu Vedas. You can achieve nirvana. You don't have to know all that stuff. Excuse me. And then I was at the Martin Luther King Day event at my alma mater. Um, it was really nice. And they quoted Martin Luther King. And he said, it's about creating a beloved community. He used to talk about that a lot. And there's a quote where he says, you don't have to know about Socrates or Aristotle to create a beloved community. <laughs> like, I know, I know you don't have to. I mean, it. You can learn from these books, good lessons, but you don't have to, to achieve nirvana or to achieve virtue. You can have the virtues without reading Aristotle's ethics book. Um, and you can read Aristotle's ethics and not be virtuous, okay? So he's separating it from any kind of doctrine. And then the tradition, um, the, the accumulated wisdom. So there's all this speculation they talk about, and that's related to the, the Vedas, the holy books. And he said, no, Buddha said, no, that's not what it's getting at. And then a couple other issues, the idea of grace, like every religion has some idea that you have access to a positive power, to a positive higher power. Um, I mean, a, a secular humanist would just say something like, well, you have the capacity to do good works and to live a good life. And you have to always keep trying. Um, and that's just the way it is, right? That's natural. That's true. And you should never get discouraged as long as you have the capacity. And um, but religion sort of make it spookier and just say, you know, God loves you, or there's positive karma, or whatever. And so Buddha said, you can get it through your own, you get in touch with the Atman, that's how you get, you get this grace, and you do it through meditation, like nobody else gives it to you, it's not a previous life, it's nothing spooky, and nothing outside of your control. So that he would have in common with the, with the secular humanist um, in the sense it's a matter of choice. And then the mystery. All right, so when the Brahmins had this control and so many people were really helpless and hopeless, they were just stuck in these castes and they were poor and they were ignorant. They became obsessed with miracles, occult, with escapism, um, and then Buddha cut that down, right? So in our time with climate change and all the social disruption, there will be people who start becoming obsessed with the devils taking over, it's the end times, and it's a kind of escapism. It's a kind of way of not just dealing with it, you know, stop using fossil fuels, Hello, <laughs> um, just do something. 
And then your mind will get a little clearer about this and you won't start looking for a conspiracy theory or some kind of occult, um, QAnon occult. Um, all right, so Buddha just tells people you have agency. It's up to you if you have a good life. Um, all right, the Four Noble Truths. Well, let me just stop there and um, ask you if you, Jack has already said he likes these, but the other, everybody just, when you read it, did it resonate? Did you just think, oh yeah, this is a pattern. Did you think of other examples where just, you know, it could be any kind of aspect of your life where you're distinguishing between what's socially constructed, what the authorities say, and what the real spirit of it, what the point was. Like, okay, I remember in math class, the point is to learn how to reason mathematically, right? And so I knew the answer to a question. I knew the steps it took to answer the problem, but I rounded it off too soon and he called the whole thing wrong. And I just thought, wait a sec, like the point of this was to learn the reasoning, not to obsess about whether it was four decimal points out or two, you know what I mean? So I think you're, you're always doing that. What's the point of this class? What's the point? And then there's all the rituals and the requirements. And when they get too ritualized, you say, there's no point, right? It's not getting to the substance of, of the whole point of having a math class or whatever. So if you can think of any examples, if anything resonated with you in terms of the corruption of authority, as opposed to the original point of having that institution or that class in the first place. Um, so why don't we start with Mia? I mean, I didn't necessarily have something where it was like a corruption of authority. I just had the exact opposite, which is like, I mean, I do have that issue in math class for sure. The exact same thing where like, mine's the exact opposite. It's like, I'll get the answer, but I'll do, I'll do the work differently than my professor currently teaches it because that's what makes more sense to my brain. And I'll get it, I'll get it completely wrong. But the example I was gonna use was like in theater, we or in one of my acting classes that I'm taking it's like he as long as we get the point of it he never he, he'll give you a good grade it's never about like oh you didn't follow this step exactly like you didn't do a b and c and this wasn't the exact performance I was looking for like he, he also doesn't really have expectations like that either he just walks in and it's like I taught you what you need to know like, let's see what you do. This, how are you going to interpret it? And so, I think that's a good example. But math class, I do have that same problem. So, <laughs> flip flop. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I do think you have to explain to people why, what you're doing, what you're doing, right? That would be the substance, and that's where the religious authorities. So, a lot of times in religion, things can get really obsessive, and trivial, and it's really supposed to be about. <laughs> these these cosmic questions and it comes down to you know do you serve wine or grape juice in your communion like huh oh you mean like the technicalities like people will go nitpick each verse and like yeah <laughs> yes okay so melanie what about you um i guess really the only thing I always kind of relate back to softball. Yeah, um, yeah. I was expecting but, that actually. Yeah, so an example for me, I guess would be like, so we have a girl on our team and her parents are like super rich and they pay for us to do a lot of things. And, you know, really she's not as talented wise as she should be to be playing, but she still gets to play every game, no matter what she does. So, yeah. Does she play the whole nine innings? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. 
I mean, if I were her parents, I think I would, I would say you don't have to do that. You know what I mean? Oh, well, so actually she started, like, she got benched. She wasn't playing. And then her parents complained. So that's why she's playing now. <laughs> that is, that's sad, right? But I mean, that's a good example where yeah. the point is to play your, have the team doing their best. Right. right. And so using money to have your daughter play. Mm -hmm. it, but I mean, that <laughs> happens in religious stuff too, right? Yeah. So you can see the analogy, mm -hmm. right? So if Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor, but then somebody says, you go to the wrong church, you're going to hell. Or, you're like, oh, right. yeah. or you don't, you're a Unitarian at a Trinitarian, you're going to hell. It's just, mm -hmm. <laughs> wait a sec, wait a sec. Um, okay, Jack. I don't know if this is um, all the way there, but I think like the war on drugs is kind of that way, <laughs> how they kind of demonize it. And it's like, especially marijuana, like having marijuana illegal and then you can go down to the liquor store and buy al as much alcohol as you want. It, it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> well, the history behind it. Um... There's a history there that has, you know, nothing to do. Somebody was not, was going to lose money. It had to do with money for why yeah. it got categorized a number one drug. Uh, it was that guy, that really rich um, guy who ran newspapers in California or something. Uh, you know, it's just this crazy story. Um, but that's where, because, you know, uh, people need laws and institutions like Socrates, like Socrates, because they need them. You can abuse that power quite a bit because people will still stick with it just to keep society ordered. Yeah. And then they will believe in the leaders even when, well, they just lose track of what the point was, which was flourishing. And so then they start obsessing about the institutions or the laws and blind obedience. And the people in power start thinking they actually are doing more than they're doing to help people flourish. Just because, you know, it would be chaos if I wasn't here, you know. And so there's just so much room for abuse. And that's why we have these constant stories of the way people hold on to power and how they abuse it, and how all these icons, Jesus, Socrates, Buddha, um, Confucius, the reason they're icons is they call them out, right? And they risk their lives to call them out. Gandhi, Martin Luther King, he knew it was likely that he'd get shot. Um, the other thing I, I think you should know is when Obama was president, he would get 30 uh, death threats a day. And every Friday he met with Joe Biden because he had to make sure Biden knew exactly what was going on in case he got shot. Did you know that? Didn't know that. No, when he ran for political office, that's just a reality you have to deal with if you're black. <laughs> Oh, boy. Anyway, so, so we have that. Um, and then Buddhist doctrine. So then I'll ask you, um, you know, to comment on this, but life is suffering if you just accept that. Now, there was a guy named Scott Peck, the road less traveled. He was a psychologist or something. He made millions of bucks just telling basically what all these ancient people say. <laughs> you know, no fair, like it, I read these books and every time it's like, oh, I should get a better messaging. I need to get an advertising agency and sell my stuff, you know, I can make money. It's <laughs> like these guys, they're stealing all these insights and making money off of it, no fair. So, if you just accept that life is suffering, 
And then you say the cause is desire and the cure is to release yourself from that desire and then the eightfold path. So for example, when COVID hit, it would be nice if students, if everybody learned the lesson, right? That you might have a fantasy about where you're going in life and all of a sudden whammo. And then you learn that, you know, the way, how do you cope with it, right? Well, if you, if you get frustrated, you get depressed, you get angry, you get blah, blah, that's on you, right? You could use the event to say, okay, I'm gonna have to learn how to not let the outside world get to me, right? I'm gonna have to learn how to, my own agency, like I can control how I react to this because I'm not particularly picked out for suffering. Like everybody's going through it. So it's an opportunity for you to gain a grip on your emotions, to learn how to deal with unexpected problems for the rest of your life. Just say, oh, well, I dealt with that with COVID. And then to learn how to bond with other people in you know, supporting each other, motivating, inspiring each other. And then when, when you are a person who's a grown up and doing this, then you admire other people who do it. And it's like a foundation for a lifelong friendship. You know, oh, remember when we went through COVID together? Um, so that would be, you know, a Buddhist reaction is that if, if you're letting it get you down, it's on you. Um, so anyway, uh, the cure is release, right? Releasing yourself. And how do you do that? Well, you have good friends. I think that's great, right? Yes, that would be intuitively obvious. And I hope some of you um, at AUW, I was teaching this at AUW, and I'm telling you, you think, it was bad. These kids are like in Syria where there's a war going on and then COVID hits or in Bangladesh. I mean, it's like, there's no comparison. And um, they, but they made friends. They made friends with the other students in the class who they hadn't even met because they hadn't yet gotten to, class, to school. Um, so I tried to use, you know, the class as this opportunity for them to start developing a sense of agency that, that they really could use the rest of their life because there will be lots of obstacles. Okay, right intent. What do you really want? And what you want is to be a person who doesn't let obstacles bother them, right? And so you don't, as soon as something happens, um, right speech, making sure that the way you're talking to yourself um, and the way you talk to other people is careful. And then it keeps you in that part of your brain that's calm, right? If you, if you can talk to yourself saying, okay, this is I can't control what had happened, but I can control how I respond. And then talk to other people, be even more careful about being gentle to them, being kind to them. Um, again, I think all the professors tried to be more generous with assignments and forgiving. And, um, so, you know, there's a lot of ways you can gain from it, right? Conduct. So you could find a way to have an exercise routine because you're home a lot more, right? So, and you learn to be more reflective, uh, right? Livelihood. This is as you graduate and start deciding what job to have, um, what effort so that you're compassionate to people, but you're detached from 
worrying about the consequences of your action. You just worry about the quality of your life and your action. Um, and then the right mindfulness is something that I'm telling you, please understand this. Please understand this. Because I'm almost 70, right? And you have to live with all the thoughts you've ever had. And I just, oh, it's awful. Like I remember getting too angry at a certain person at a certain time and I have to live with it. It's terrible. So try to catch yourself at the beginning. Buddha's right, you know, try not to make it a passive aggressive thing where there's sometimes rational anger where you do need to confront somebody. Maybe you, I don't think you need to literally get brain chemistry angry. You could just say, that is not acceptable to me. Like you can't treat me that way. And, you know, but so it's not pretending nothing's happening. It's just that you can solve problems without letting it bother you because it will make an imprint on your head and you will have to live with it. So please, you've been warned, all right? Then he sat under the bow tree and he had his experience. And um, he taught for 45 years. I didn't have a set doctrine. It's just a way of life. So Buddhists, you know, they'll talk about Buddha and his way of life. They might give examples of what he did. They, you know, they try to just develop their meditation techniques. Um, all right. So the doctrine of no soul karma. Um, let me see how far. Yeah, okay. I'll go down to here. The characteristics. This is where Houston Smith, again, he is unifying science and religion. He says this is very scientific. It's based on personal experience. It's lived experience, cause effect. Yeah, you have a hypothesis, you know, what happens to your body if you sit this way or you breathe this way? And so it was just long tested. You get to this point where these techniques are the ones that really keep the energy flowing. Uh, you're solving problems, problems about how to maintain your um, serenity of mind in the midst of a lot of stuff. It's therapeutic, um, it's psychological, it's egalitarian, that's really important. It's, and also class, it doesn't discriminate on class, which is so important. Class is such a divider. Um, and it's individual. So you don't look at other people's, you don't covet other people's stuff, right? You, you just, it's an inner eye, right? It's a third eye that you look at life with and carry with you when you go into the world. Um, and there's two schools. One of them are the monks that stay in the monastery and teach and one go to the, go out to the world. Um, let me stop there for a minute and see what comments you have. Let's see, who did I call on first before? Okay, Jack, maybe it's your turn to go first. Jack, yeah. I don't really have a comment right now. Okay, so you didn't have a, any further reaction from what you said. Okay. Um, okay, Melanie? Uh, I just like the idea of intentional living, mm -hmm. like having uh, the right intent about everything that you do all the time. And I think people will stray away from that a lot. You know, they just get into the their own idea of what they're doing and what they should be doing. And they don't think about, well, what's the real reason I'm doing this? Why am I doing this? Good. Um, I'll tell you another thing that worries me about American culture. 
we have that doctrine of original sin is in the back of a lot of people's minds and it's affected the way the culture is structured. So it's an idle mind is the devil's plaything, right? You're supposed to be always doing something or else the devil is going to, you know, cause you to have sexual fantasies or something like that. Oh, okay. So, so much of what the culture focuses on is sports, business, all this stuff that's very competitive and that you have to make constant decisions about. And so it's very anti-intentional, right? It's very hard to sit back and, and develop a really, really thoughtful way of life because you keep getting re rewarded for these constant, you know, um, doing stuff. You are what you do instead of you are what you think or you are how you do the things you do. Does that make sense to you, Melanie? Yes. Okay, so it's good if you can maintain that kind of intentionality and be a coach, because you'll have a lot of people, I, mean, I know you know this because you've been on teams, but you'll have a lot of kids on teams that won't be that intentional, and then you can show them and you can tell them, you know, they should stand back. Is that what you sort of have in mind as part of your role modeling? Uh, yes, ma'am. Hopefully, I'm going to try. <laughs> That's great. Um, what about you, Mia? Uh, I just like the idea that kind of keeps getting brought up of just, it kind of ties in with what, me what, what Melanie said, which is just like being gentle and kind and genuine and then in turn being understanding when other people are expressing like their genuine emotion. Like, like you said, sometimes it's good to just express your anger and not be what passive aggressive about things. And so that's part of being genuine though. And so, I don't know, I like that. I like the like honesty and everything, the idea of that, because I think that at least in like, kind of how, like, I don't know, in the 10 commandments, like for Christianity and kind of how it was, preach to me was like just put up with everything and just like be nice don't kill anybody and probably be nice to your parents like <laughs> I don't know that's kind of so I like the idea of everyone is open and honest and I just feel like that would make for a much more much better society right. it comes from a deeper place though right it comes from a place where you're not just reacting to what's in front of you right, right. um okay so now I'm going to ask you now that I'm I'm going to say now that COVID is waning, it's over, or at least it's letting go. Um, when you look back, do you think you handled it well? Do you think you learned some life lessons from that experience? Um, Jack. Like getting angry? Well, just did you learn how to be more reflective or did you learn how to, did you start thinking about that, you know, you set goals for yourself, but when they get frustrated, you have to cope and stuff like that. I mean, just, did you learn some life lesson? Yeah, I guess you just have to adapt, not really go with like a set plan all the time you just have to be kind of um malleable i guess did you think some of the people you know well like family or friends did a better job of dealing with it than others um yeah um i would say i'm better than my parents at dealing with it for sure you. well you're yeah. a philosopher so <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, do you think your natural reflective tendency helped? Definitely. Okay, good. Um, you know, family systems kind of work where whatever is missing in the in the thing, the kid will sort of go there, <laughs> mm. right? Because every family needs a certain level of reflection in every person. And if some people don't have it, somebody else will have extra, 
right? Yeah. To compensate for it. Yeah, that's Greek tragedy for you. Okay. <laughs> um, what about you, Mia? How do, what life lessons do you think you learned? I kind of also just like the importance of being self-reflective and everything. I spent a lot of time in quarantine. Like also everyone was in lockdown, but whenever I did have COVID, like I was quarantined for over a month. And so like, that's a lot of time being locked in your room. And it's just like, you kind of get to take a look at like what's going on around you. I watched a lot of news. I kind of paid attention to things like that because I, I was literally just bored out of my mind. And it's like, you kind of just realize that, I don't know, at least in that time period that I was in, it was just like, no one, no one was handling anything. Everyone was just like, it was so chaotic at all times. There was no balance. And I think sort of, oh, maybe that is life lesson I learned, just the importance of like balance and maintaining like some sort of, not necessarily control because you can't control everything, but like maintaining a calmness and just like, understanding that you do have to adapt you do have to like move forward with whatever situation happens like that's just part of the deal so i don't know people trying to resist it was not fixing anything so i just do not like it when the news all it does is say well what's the mood of the public right now as if you don't have any responsibility to grow up and the politicians should just pander to whatever mood the people are in. Like, we're never going to have a decent society. And then they get mad at the politicians because all they do is make these promises and they don't give me what I want. Well, what you want is stupid. You know, <laughs> like, I, I, it just scares me, right? But then you can... I, you know, I'd be curious, I guess I'm going to teach this from now on, like, what did you learn? Did you, because your character was being tested, it's a critical moment. And, you know, looking back, you might even think, I wish I had been more of a grown up. And I, I'm speaking for myself, right? There's certain times in my life, when there were a lot of critical moments, and I disappointed myself, right? I thought I would be stronger. And um, so I, you know, I have to think about that and think about, am I self-correcting? So next time I wouldn't make that mistake. I mean, I really thought I was more grown up than X, Y, Z, right? Um, so I, I hope, you know, also, like you really figure out who your friends really are. You really figure out who the strong characters are because they stand out. And then if people are weak and they start reacting, it just makes it worse, right? It makes it hard for everybody. Does that make sense to you, Mia? Okay. What about you, Melanie? Um, I think I just learned the importance of empathy like being able to see <clears throat> the other person's side um, and put yourself in their shoes. Because if you get so self-centered in, you know, your views and what you think and how you feel, you're going to be closed-minded for your whole life. And that just sucks. And <laughs> I mean, you, you can't learn anything that way. And you kind of, not everyone, but a lot of times you become a bad person because you can't form I guess, like intimate relationships with people that don't think exactly how you do. So do you think that you were that way before COVID or do you think COVID sort of um, increased your um, self-conscious awareness? Yeah, I think COVID definitely increased it, increased it a lot. Um, but I, I feel I was pretty empathetic <clears throat> before then, but definitely now I'm like <laughs> very, very empathetic. Did you develop a reputation among people who knew you because other um, people weren't? Um, I would say after post-COVID, yes. Kind of that's how people see me now. Like 
very trustworthy, loyal. Like they feel they can come talk to me about a lot of things. So yeah. So did COVID, how did COVID affect that? Um, like how did it affect my reputation? Yeah. Um, well, I think I took my relationships, like friendships and um, family a lot more seriously and was able to express my love and gratitude towards my relationships more. So, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So let me um, summarize where I guess where we're going to go next time. We'll start on Zen Buddhism and that goes with the artwork. So we'll do the artwork, the view of reality underneath the ink paintings because it's a Zen view of reality. Um, oh, I have this again. All right, there's the artwork and the Zen. Okay, so we got that. So we'll start with that and then we'll do Buddhism. Um, what did I? What did I sign for today? Buddhism, yeah, okay. And then we'll do, did I say Buddhism and the environment for the next time? Well, whatever, I guess I'll just follow my own. Um, and Buddhism and the brain. Um, and then what well, we have Buddhism and women and Buddhism and the environment. All right, the next day. Let me just throw this at you. This is what I usually do first thing. Did you, I guess you didn't read this, but this, we could start next time with your reaction to this. Can you imagine your religious leader saying this? Don't believe anything just because you've heard it. Don't believe in traditions because they've been handed down. This is very Buddha. Buddha said this, right? Don't believe the Brahmins. Don't believe, you know. Uh, don't believe anything because it's been spoken and rumored by the Brahmins or anybody else. Don't believe it just because it's in the books. Don't believe it on the authority of teachers. But after your own observation analysis, it's conducive to the good and benefit of one and all, then do it, right? Um, that's pretty amazing to most of my students because they don't think of religion that way, right? So I, I do want you to blow your mind that religion doesn't have to be this doctrine, ritual, self-righteous, whatever. Um, the Dalai Lama is just the reverse of all of that. So he does represent that sort of worldview. He is, everything is about compassion. So it's still out there. There's the good karma is still out there now. Myanmar, the country is a Buddhist country, and they kicked out all the Rohingya Muslims. It's the biggest um, refugee camp in the world is in southern Bangladesh, a million people in a refugee camp. And I have students who grew up in that refugee camp. Oh, my God, because it's 100 miles from where I've been teaching. But Anyway, so Buddhists can get caught up in politics and money and all that. But the religion itself is pretty obviously not that way. So, all right, we'll see you.